Good afternoon. The Stone Age did not end because the world ran out of stone. Likewise, the fossil era will not end because we don't have any oil or gas or coal left. It will only end if we decide to make conscious political decisions. Now, the good news is that we have the alternatives. We know what to do. Hopefully, at this COP, we will also be able to make the political decisions making this transition real so that we can stay below 1.5 degrees. This is absolutely imperative. Now, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is an alliance of countries and sub-national governments that have decided to be leaders in the face out of fossils. Today, we are very fortunate to be joined by ministers who will share with you their sentiments and their recommendations for the last hours of this COP. And with those remarks, it gives me pleasure to start by introducing the French minister. Please, the floor is yours. Um, okay, it's working. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming and uh, hello to my old colleagues that are working like hell to uh, finalize a good agreement. Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is a coalition of ambitious first movers, which France supported from the start. It gathers more and more members from all the regions of the world. The momentum has come to act and agree on ambitious and clear language on fossil fuels. At the national level, France took ambitious commitments in 2017 to ban new exploration and exploitation of fossil fuels and to completely stop exploitation by 2040. COP28 should be the COP where parties make ambitious commitment towards phasing out fossil fuels in order to keep, to give, keep 1.5 alive. As the UN Secretary General said, phase down is not enough. Abatement cannot be used to delay action. We need the phase out of fossil fuel production and consumption. Today, demands for phasing out fossil fuels language in the final COP decision are coming from countries from all over the world, from small island developing states, from Latin America, from Africa, from North America, and from the EU. Many big emerging countries are on board. This language obviously needs to come with strong language on means of implementation. The momentum has never been stronger. The transition away from fossil fuels needs to be just, equitable, and orderly to be accepted, to be managed, to be a success. We cannot ask countries to choose between development and climate change. And we believe there is a way to respond to the needs for energy access and growth with fossil-free energies. It implies investments and support. We can show that it creates local quality jobs, improves health from less air pollution, increases energy security, and avoid stranded assets and stranded workers. So together, we are stronger and more committed. Together, we can face this challenge. Together, we can get an ambitious result at the COP. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Colombia's Minister, Susana Mohamed. Thank you very much. We joined the Beyond Oil and Gas uh, Coalition this year in uh, August. And uh, we as a country uh, understand the reality of the science and the science is clear in saying that we need the phase out of the production, exploitation, and consumption of fossil fuels. 
Of course, this is not a transition that will happen from one day to the other. Whole economies and societies are dependent on this fossil economy, on this fossil capital. And this will require, though, then a just phase out and also an orderly transition. We could face two situations. One, where some countries decarbonize their economy, which are today main markets for producers, and suddenly, in one or two decades, countries like Colombia that are exporters of coal and oil end up having an economic crisis, and there was no multilateral agreement to support that transition. Or we could choose the path of committing towards keeping 1.5 alive, which will be the safety limit for humanity, and at the same time work together in an orderly economic transition that allows this to not cause further crisis in different societies. For this, we are calling as BOGA that this needs a strong financial reform. This will not happen on its own. The oil industry, the fossil capital, will not disappear because the COP takes a decision. This requires other instruments that go beyond that, and we need to align the economic and financial systems to the reality of the climate crisis. And we need support as developing countries and economies for a just transition. And this should not be only words, but it needs to become commitments. But the first step is the COP because we should send here the strong political message that this is the pathway. And then all of us together should mobilize all the international institutions and all the multilateral architecture that we have to be able to have the system that we need for this transition so that we can make a reality that this will be for all and nobody will be left behind. Thank you, Susanna. And now, Eamon Ryan from Ireland. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been very honoured to be working with Agnes on the, for the European Union in some of the bilateral negotiations on the means of the implementation. And we do that with a clear purpose that we have to make the change the financial architecture, as Suzanne said yesterday, so that it's quicker, better, cheaper, more economically secure, cleaner to invest in the clean alternative rather than the fossil. And we know the International Energy Agency is providing very good analysis as to the scale of that challenge. Even if we delivered all the uh, pledges on renewables development, efficiency gains, uh, methane reductions, they presented analysis this week showing that that would only bring us some one third of the way to where we need to go. We need to go beyond that and phasing out fossil fuels as a way of sticking to the 1.5 degrees. But also they show the fossil fuel industry is still planning investing 800 billion a year when if we were to stick to Paris that should be at least cut in half. And some of that 400 billion euros could surely then alternatively be switched into the over 4 trillion a year we know we need to invest in the clean alternative if we are going to meet our goals. What's critical in this is that it has to be a just transition. It has to be something that benefits every, or particularly those countries in the world who have been frozen out of the financing system for the clean alternative, who are hit most by the debt difficulties and the financial problems we see in the world today. And there's various strands to that. This is complex and broad. It has to be helped those who are committing to leave fossil fuels in the ground. It has to help those who are looking to invest in the clean alternative. In my mind, particularly looking at clever ways in which we bring public and private finance together, blended forms of finance which do what was set out the requirement of the Bridgetown Initiative to narrow the interest rate gap, to reduce the, some of the currency, regulatory and other gaps as problems that are there that will unlock this opportunity for development and climate to go together. More than anything else, we in the European Union recognise that that requires investment in capacity building in countries, whether that's a small island state or less developed country, emerging economy. It's that lack of capacity in the financing system, the regulatory system, government systems is going to be key. That we share te technology. This is not something 
that we will fight over. It's a zero-sum game. The power comes free, and the more other countries develop the alternative, the better for everyone. So beyond oil and gas isn't just about alliance, isn't just about divesting and switching off. It is about helping switch on and switching to that cleaner alternative. And it's with that vision we go into the negotiations today, waiting for the text that needs to give the political signal so that the financial markets understand what is coming, that they start to change. Currently, it's not pricing in the cost of carbon, the cost of this fossil fuel industry. That needs to change. Thank you, Ministers. Um, so we have a full house and we have about 10 minutes for questions and we really want to prioritise Q&A time. So let me thank all of our civil society friends for coming and joining us and we'll prioritise questions from the press. And we'll go in rounds of three and if you can state name, affiliation and if your question is directed at anyone in particular. Um, if I can start over here and then we'll head to the white shirt with the microphone and then we'll head over there to the front. Kate Abnett from Reuters. Um, the deal that you're negotiating here is not legally binding. So please could you explain what would it actually mean in the real world for governments and businesses and citizens if there was an agreement at COP on phasing out fossil fuels? Thanks. Hey, I'm uh, Rasmus Svaneborg from the Danish uh, news agency Ritzau. I was wondering if you could specifically tell us all what countries are blocking a deal on phasing out fossil fuels right now. Uh, okay, I'm Anneli Miegner Arn from Swedish TV4. I'm wondering about this uh, global stock take um, document that was supposed to come a couple of hours ago. Um, what do you know about it? Why hasn't it arrived? And what is your take on what's in it right now? Okay, thank you. So we'll stop there with those three questions. And if I can start, maybe, Minister. Why hasn't the text arrived? Because it's difficult. Listen, the presidency is working extremely hard trying to, to put together a, a text that will be the basis for, for the last negotiations. I think we should give them the time that, that they need. Now, what does it mean if we mention a phase out of fossils here, was asked, I think it was Kate from, from Rogers. Since it is not putting legally binding obligations on every country. It's a good question, but the whole nature of the Paris Agreement is that it's national, nationally determined contributions. And this means, of course, that we don't, as a community, as a global community, force any countries to do anything. But nonetheless, it's still an extremely important tool. And what we're looking into now is uh, two years of preparation before COP30, where we will have new NDCs. And what informs these NDCs, or put differently, what we decide needs to be in those NDCs are extremely important. So this is why this is the COP where we need to say these NDCs need to be informed by one, a decision to phase out fossils, two, hopefully also a global target on renewable energy and energy efficiency. If we don't do that, I think we, uh, we waste a big opportunity for us to make a, a real difference with regards to staying below 1.5, and I would even turn it around and say that it would be a catastrophe if that did not happen, because the momentum is here now, the chance is here now, the, the, the wording is on the, the table uh, to be negotiated, and this is why uh, so many countries are, are here today uh, arguing that this is uh, a necessity. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Ryan and then Minister Sove. Just one broad point, if I can, on, on, on the overall text. The GST will be the central document, central decision we need to make. 
it has to include so many different items. It has to be broad. And it isn't, mitigation is hugely important, but not, that's not the only issue. We, there's been, there needs to be a greater focus on the adaptation file because that too is critical, particularly for the lesser developed emerging economies. So it will be a balanced text. It won't be what everyone wants. It won't be the perfect wording for everyone. But if we can get the balance right between the various elements, then that's key. With regard to the question about um, it not being legally binding our decisions, um, there is an area, though, where we do have control in this means of implementation, in the application of public finance, that's in the control of governments. I see it like an onion, where at the core you have the public financing, you have multilateral development banks financing, domestic financing, and then private financing, and onwards and outwards from there, philanthropy and uh, sovereign wealth funds and so on. We can change the form of the multilateral development banks and leverage that for change into the financial sector. And the text, as was presented in the recent days, was not bad text. It had a lot of good signals, and that's what we're giving, particularly in the means of implementation. It will not be decided here. Next year is more critical in that regard. But we cannot wait. We have to send these signals now. And I think there are a lot of initiatives out there, screen shoots happening, where these sort of guarantee schemes for countries uh, blended financing mechanisms, capacity building arrangements, in the financial sector particularly, that's already starting to happen. We can get it to grow dramatically if we give a clear signal in this direction, because that is in our control, and through that, change the wider financial system to the scale of change we need. Thank you, Minister Seve. And then we'll take another round of questions. We're really short on time, so quick and concise, please. So this works? Oh, okay. <coughs> So I'd like to contribute to the discussion around the legally binding uh, commitment. Um, so all of us in this room would like to see a very strong language um, coming out of this COP in terms of phasing out of fossil fuels. Um, and all of us uh, up on this table have committed towards the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, and that's why we are in this room. And so I put my hat off to Dan uh, and his team from Denmark for their leadership in bringing around countries to recognize uh, the importance of facing out of fossil fuel. Uh, but that is a, a, a national um, commitment uh, for member states that are part of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. I want to inform this room, uh, all of you, that there is now a movement towards addressing that legally binding commitment on facing out fossil fuel. And this is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, there are 12 countries already, uh, members of this alliance. Um, it is our aim that uh, there will be an international regime instrument uh, recognized under international law, you know, binding the member states to uh, facing out of fossil fuel. So we are now starting that momentum, and we are opening membership to others to be part of this international movement, a global uh, push towards a legally binding uh, commitments towards uh, facing out of fossil fuel. Thank you, Minister Seve. If I can go to, if we take the question in the very front row, the green shirts, if we head back, long hair in the middle, and then do we have one on this side? No, over here. As quick and concise as possible, please, and we'll do one last round and then a family. I'll try. <laughs> so, Peter Adelsig from Swedish Daily, Dagens Nyheter. So, 2023 has been the warmest year on record, and emissions keep increasing. And I think the world is looking for a moment that can change that situation. Can this be that moment? Hi, Georgia Gretton from Argus Media. Um, very quickly, is abatement on the table as a bargaining chip in negotiations? Thank you. And the one final one here. James Deneen from New Scientist. My question is for France and Colombia. Um, do you support any kind of language on differentiated responsibility for phasing out fossil fuels? And why haven't we seen that language in any of the options um, in the GST text we've seen so far? Thanks. Okay, so if we can keep responses really fast, and um, Mr. Petan, to you first. 
Thank you. Uh, I wanted to answer on the first question. Can this be the moment? Yes, it can. It requires that we all agree that this is the time, the time to agree on phasing out fossil fuels. And I think that it is clear to the world that when it comes to oil and gas, sooner rather than later, we must agree to keep it in the ground. It's evident when you look at the science and the knowledge that we all have and that we discuss when we're in the negotiation room that if we keep using fossil fuels, we will not stop global warming. And I understand that it can be difficult, more difficult for countries that uh, grow their economy on that basis, which differs from, for example, my country, but this is a discussion of phasing out. The word is phasing. It is possible to shift the economic structure and architecture that we have towards benefiting and growing our economies on other bases than on the fossil fuels. So when we speak of peaking, we speak of peaking of emissions. We want the emissions to go down from peaking. We don't want our economies to go down from peaking. We need to find new sources to grow our economies, specifically for the countries that are in the middle of that process. We need to take specific consideration to that. So I think that we all need to take care of the opportunities that come of this, but also understand that fossil fuel peak must take place within this decade, according to every solid calculation. It's the only way to reach 1.5 degrees. Thank you. Thank you. And Tina. Thanks. Oh, it's working. Um, I, would, I would echo what um, the minister has just said. This, this has to be the moment. I know it's, a, it's, a, it's a question, can it be the moment? This, this has to be the moment for the Marshall Islands. Um, you know, we've just come out with a national adaptation plan which is costed at $35 billion um, to save some of the islands. And that's if we um, save 1.5. Minister from Colombia has spoken to the fact that beyond 1.5, that, that's a hard limit. We cannot adapt above 1.5. Above 1.5 is just loss and damage. There's not enough money in the world to pay for the loss and damage that we would face above 1.5. So this has to be the moment. And we're hearing from more and more coalitions about to, to, that, 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 that are showing that the momentum is there. We, we have this coalition, the Beyond Oil and Gas, and I echo the remarks about the really good work that Minister Dan and his team have done. Um, we had the High Ambition Coalition, which the Marshall Islands chairs, which also is bringing parties around the table to, to push for this. We, we are hearing from civil society. I had a meeting earlier today with the We Mean Business Coalition. The momentum is this year, so this has to be the moment. Um, and in order to make this real, re, real, it's not just that we send the signal in the words and the text, which is absolutely critical but we provide the means to deliver on, on those words. And so the text also needs to have the support, and that's, that's a critical piece as well. It needs to be a package. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Answering the question about differentiation, uh, we all want to see in the text the compromise on global phase out uh, to achieve net zero 2050, but also to limit uh, in between the limit of 1.5. But as my colleague from Colombia said, we all are open to consider differentiation on peaking and also the just transition of some countries. And that is very important. We want global peaking to be addressed on the text, but we accept differentiation. And that is a key element to reaching the agreement. Thank you. And with that, we'll close questions. Minister Jurgensen, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. So the guy clapping wasn't because he liked it, it's because he wanted us out of the room. But <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. I'm sure some ministers will be able to answer bilateral questions also. Thank you.